Discover over 100 episodes of Bartholomew Town on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. You know, that, that, that is somewhat pervasive, uh, honestly, across the world. Uh, you know, people's first instinct is to say why something can't be done. I completely defy that notion and, and just sort of charge ahead. We have so many things going on in Rhode Island that are under the radar. People don't know that are so good and so instrumental and add to the quality of life in our state. People, but but we just don't get to it. We just don't see it. You know, so many people are wrapped up in their narrow cast worlds. Yeah, that if they just open their eyes just a little bit, we'll all be better off. Welcome in to another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew. On today's episode, I sit down with Dante Bellini Jr. Dante Bellini, the recently semi-retired partner and executive vice president of RDW Group. And through 41 years in Rhode Island mass media, he's amassed a treasure trove of stories and offers a unique and often sought after perspective on the state's nuances, characters, and future. Now, RDW Group, some of you are probably wondering what that is. Well, it's a Rhode Island-based integrated communications firm. And hey, look, if you grew up in southern New England or you spent any amount of time here, even beyond, you may not even realize it, but you've definitely, at least almost certainly, consumed a healthy dose of their work through their messaging with brands, organizations, and even state government. So they are truly attached to many of the legacy brands right here in Rhode Island. Support for Bartholomew Town comes from Lagunitas Brewing Company, helping to present Elmwood Songwriters Club, a recurring performance series featuring intimate sets by Rhode Island artists from a variety of communities held at the Bartholomew Town Loft in the Elmwood neighborhood of Providence. Always great to hear from you, the listeners. My email address is bill at ripodcast.com. All right, without further ado, let's go to my conversation with the one and only Dante Bellini Jr., You were here during, uh, well, you still are here, but that your, your career existed during uh, a lot of transformational periods in Rhode Island and in the Rhode Island media, and, and that must have affected the way that your you know, messaging was handled in this state. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long, interesting ride, and uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't change it for, for anything. Um, I, uh, I started in this business as a junior in college, and uh, I was the gopher, and that means, yeah. you know, go for coffee and empty the trash, and I did that on my last day of work as well, uh, uh, officially, um, but in that time, you're, you're absolutely correct, Bill, I saw a lot of, a lot of change, and uh, a lot of it was for the better, and a lot of it wasn't so much for the better. But uh, one thing has remained constant in that, that whole time is that, you know, good people always rise up and uh, they get things done. And um, the inherent goodness of people uh, always seems to prevail. And, you know, if I had one takeaway from my career, uh, that would be it. Is that a Rhode Island thing or do you think that's a human nature thing? You know? I think it's a I think it's a human nature thing, but it's certainly tougher in Rhode Island. Yeah, <laughs> um, for a lot of reasons. And I have been fortunate to come across um, some really unique, some remarkable people in my travels. Uh, I've worked with uh, celebrities, uh, large and small. I've worked with uh, captains of industry, um, people that as a as a young person growing up, I never thought I'd meet, and um, I did, and they were listening to me, and that's uh, sort of a weird and odd uh, thing, right. uh, you know, when you look back on it. Who was the wildest, who, what was the moment where you were, you know, really awestruck at your own situation, where you go, wow, this is actually happening right now? Um, I have so many. Yeah. I, I literally have so many, um, but... Uh, a guy that you probably don't remember other than, well, you'll look him up. His name is Peter Graves, and he was uh, a Mission Impossible lead actor. Oh, wow. And uh, he was, uh, we got him as a spokesperson for one of my clients, and uh, I had to pick him up at Logan Airport, and he was absolutely smashed. <laughs> and I had to shoot what in those days, uh, 1984, mm -hmm. was a $100,000 TV spot. <clears throat> it was huge money, and here I am, this 20-something kid 
in charge of this and I'm saying, you know, my life is over, my career is over because this guy is smashed and he's never going to be able to do it. Yeah. And he proceeded to get more smashed. And uh, at the six, and I was responsible for him. At the 6 a.m. call the next morning, knocked on his door. He was bright eyed and bushy tailed, ready to go, and nailed it in one take. Wow. <laughs> um, so I said, oh, I can do this. Yeah. Work hard, play hard, keep the, uh, right. manage them just enough to get it, get the job done. Right, right. right. In terms of the clientele you worked with, I mean, there's some names that you'd be familiar with if you grew up around anywhere in Rhode Island or southern New England and right. beyond. Of course, right. you know, any anything that happened in that world that, you know, we should, any stories to share, I suppose. Well, locally, <laughs> I think I've touched pretty much every Rhode Island icon <laughs> yeah. at one time or another. Um, I represented uh, Rocky Point Park for a period of 10 years. Yep. And... Um, um, that was a very interesting ride, both literally and figuratively. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the Big Blue Bug, uh, mm -hmm. Benny's, um, among among others, and I've tangentially, you know, been involved with pretty much everything else, from the State House to Dell's Lemonade to Newport Creamery to you know anything that is uh, uh, Rhode Island. Yeah, decidedly Rhode Island. We have so many iconic brands here that are, I mean, any community does have that, but people are extra attached potentially here. You know, when Benny's was essentially disappearing before our eyes, I mean, it was a, it was a bit of a mini crisis for some Rhode Islanders, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Benny's had a great run. Uh, they mm -hmm. were here for nearly 94 years, and, um, you know, the ownership decided that it was time for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, and they wanted to go out on their terms, not on someone else's terms. And in this world of Amazon and uh, incredible uh, retail competitiveness, um, and the fact that they did not have a line of succession that, you know, was willing to, you know, buy buy in and take over, um, it was it was a uh, it was a really good decision, and they were able to do it to the detriment of so many Rhode Islanders who miss it, and, you know, right. and they miss it for a whole bunch of reasons other than commerce. And that's the, you know, the interesting thing. It, it's more of a spiritual thing yeah. for so many Rhode Islanders. Um, and so when I run across people every single day that say, oh, I miss Benny's. I wish they were here. I wanted to, you know, I needed something. And, you know, my internal response is, well, you should have gone a lot more while they were open. Right, you know? right, right. So, um, so it's uh, really interesting. I'm happy for them. And, you know, they, they, did, they did great by Rhode Island. And that scent of tire mixed with whatever else on a snow day, you know, pre-snow day. Is... It was the special sauce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. As far as your relationship with the media, um, I mean, as we were coming in, you had mentioned uh, the great Jim Terracani, of course, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's not just uh, a passive relationship between branding and news media in terms yeah. of the broad media compass. Sometimes that's a really active, engaged relationship. Is that kind of how it was here for you, as you, especially as you're be beginning to make a name for yourself? Well, you know, it's Rhode Island, and we're so close, and we're so connected, and um, you know, it's a it's a it's a unique dynamic in in many respects. I'm fortunate that I uh, grew up in this business with the likes of Jack White, with Jim Taracani, Doug White. Uh, there were so many people who were so kind and instructive to me. I was, uh, as I said to you, I was a snot-nosed kid thinking I was smarter than I was. Uh, and they told me that I wasn't, but they told me I wasn't in the nicest possible way and right. uh, helped me and redirected me to what I should know and how I should approach things. They took the time to do that. Um, I, I am forever indebted to, uh, to, those, to those people. They were um, a special brand of professional and um, wonderful. And I, you know, I don't know that the word is, I, I'm not quite sure what that word is, but um, you know, Jack, Jack didn't have to be nice to me. Jim didn't have to be nice to me. They just could have shoved me aside and said, figure it out, figure it out yourself or, you know, not taking my calls. Uh, but they did. And, uh, you know, I'm heartened even in our present day by, you know, Tim, uh, Tim White and uh, Jack's son and Ted Nisi and Dan McGowan 
and uh, so many others, uh, you know, who are doing just great work, thoughtful work uh, every day. Um, they're not, you know, they're not just calling it in. They're, you know, they're making it happen with thoughtful and um, substantive uh, stuff, I think. I had a guest on here uh, less than 24 hours ago, and in terms of the sequence of when the audience is hearing this, this will air prior to this um, episode I'm describing. Last night, Sam Bell, Senator Sam Bell, told me that Rhode Island would be better off without the media, that the fourth branch of government actually is so in the tank for the entrenched powers in Rhode Island that we would be far better off without it. And I obviously, the interview was about two hours long as I tried to unpack and wrap my head around this. I mean, that's the most absurd statement I think you could make, right? I mean, the Rhode Island media, yeah, it's flawed and you have everywhere, but... So he's suggesting what? There ought to be no media in Rhode Island because it is so far in the tank, in his mind, uh, for establishment ideals. Well, I'd I'd love to know the reaction of the folks that I aforementioned uh, right. <laughs> you know I, I just uh, I, shocking, I, right? it's it's shocking because I think if anything I think that we're living in an age where the the media or at least those people in the media that are um, as thoughtful as I just mentioned are questioning everything they're questioning they're looking at everything they're they're trying to understand everything in a much deeper context and how it relates to other things that we may not even be thinking about, and um, uh, I completely and I completely uh, disagree with uh, Senator Bell on on that. I I don't think that um, the media that I know is in the bag of of government at all. Yeah, it's it was it was a shocking statement. He followed that up with complaining about how the court system, because there's no media covering the courts in Rhode Island, they have. You know they're apt to maneuver in a way that that maybe defies. That's, that's completely ludicrous. Right. The, the the media covers the courts all the time. Right. AP is was down there all the time. Right. So yeah, I, I as you mentioned those names, I'm waking up now. I haven't really processed that in terms of out loud to another person since I went through this interview yesterday. And uh, yeah, these are special people here. These yeah. are special people. They're working hard, even if they have a conservative bent in some cases or a liberal bent. Very rarely are they putting that out there for people to see in my mind well i'm thinking about uh, you know take just take the the partners the partners care new england hospital deal yeah and the kind of the volume of words alone that nisi has written about it right. um <laughs> and how how deep and and how developed his sources are uh when he writes stories like that um i think that there's a there's a wonderful intersection right now between the media and responsible elected officials. Um, and it, it may have existed before, but existed in a different form that we're not, you know, that we're seeing more viscerally today. Yep. Um, you know, I think that those elected officials that have nothing to hide and that want to be transparent and want to do the right thing understand that they have to be um, in lockstep in some respects with the media. And, um, you know, I think that that's a good thing, a positive thing. It is, and it, it is not something where they're using each other. I think it's something that is a sort of a necessary evolution of the relationship. Yeah, me too. I've, I've, I found that most of the elected officials in Rhode Island that I've had conversations with, they're delighted to just not have me jump on top of them when I'm asking them questions, you know, just to be able to actually communicate and <laughs> and that it is a partnership in terms of that's how obviously the current president is really just a communicator in chief. That's how he got to, right. you know. And had he not been so communicative, we'd never know that, <laughs> you know, we had airports and we had airplanes and <laughs> that's why we won. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's obvious to me and people are making right. fun of it. It's, right. it's shocking. Yeah. yeah. People often ask me, um, when they have, when are you going to write a book about, you know, an expose about what happens, you know, what really happens. Right. Um, I'm not old enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's your relationship been like with those 
on in, in state government in in terms of governors on down you had any obviously yeah. work done work at the state house but what that seems like another very very uh because of the size of the state and the, the nature of just how media and politics works here very specifically the, the sort of national sport aspect of it brands they they're kind of interacting with the government on a regular basis well i you know um i've done a lot of uh, work for state agencies um and and over the years you know i've seen my share of good and bad people just like in every other walk of life and every other you know industry it's and it goes back to you know that premise that if you are committed passionate you know smart enough willing to work hard enough you know you're going to do a great job and you know you're the kind of person that i want to i want to i want to work with and play with um and there are those that are just really literally dialing it in and you know waiting around to collect their pension check 20 and 25 years later and you know go do something else they just don't care um and that's the sad part that's the sadness to me of those in the public sector because there are a whole bunch of those people that literally don't care about their work um i've been fortunate to know so many that truly care about their work and um but you know simultaneously it's it's just you know you you're working hard and you're seeing someone else who's not and that's got to be that's got to be the worst feeling for people in government to be working side by side with those who don't care i can't imagine you, that you could get motivated enough to get things done when you're kind of in that environment so yeah and um you know so many no there are so many no's in public uh, public life. Everything yeah. is a no. It's a no until it's a yes is always what I say, right? But it, you can ask pretty much any question and it's the initial response is no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's a, you know, that, that, that is somewhat pervasive, uh, honestly, across the world. Uh, you know, people's first instinct is to say why something can't be done. I completely defy that notion and, and, just sort of charge ahead my my partners and colleagues often you know um reprimand me <laughs> um or question we'll call it reckless uh, <laughs> you know endangerment of the uh, the brand <laughs> right call, call call me reckless yeah um because i i'm not a process guy yeah and i've never been a process guy and that's to my detriment every now and then but mm -hmm. um I, I just i i i always feel like i can see what needs to be done. I can see beyond the process and I just want to get to it. And, um, uh, you know, that's, it's just a, it's just a style. Yeah. And that's been obviously fairly effective for you over the, uh, this 41 year stretch here. <laughs> it depends on who you ask. <laughs> right. You love your work though. I mean, you can just tell at a certain level, I mean, that must have made your, you know, the, the, the actual experience. I magical. love ev I love, every part of the creative process. I love doing the work and I love helping clients out of a mess. Um, and I love doing good work and doing good work for good people. Um, and we are, we pride ourselves at RDW, we pride ourselves that, you know, we're positive change agents. And we really mean that. Um, I have some great partners, former partners, but they'll always be my partners. Um, Jim Malakowski, Jim Ponarelli, Phil Lasco, Jay Conway, Jeff Patch, just the greatest people in the world, uh, highly creative and highly driven by understanding clients and understanding their issues um, and doing the very best that we can for them. But more importantly, wanting to bring a, a goodness to the work that can somehow help that little piece of the world or the larger world. You know, we do so much pro bono work. We do so much advocacy work as well. I'm so proud of the work that we've done for the Department of Health, for instance. I'm so proud of the work we've done for the Department of Transportation and the ripple effect. Yep. Um, it's, it's so fulfilling. We're so fortunate to have a Nave in Salem be, be in this state and doing the work that she does that has literally saved 8 million people 
eight million children and their moms, um, and it's not giving them one little bar. It's a regimen of four, six, eight weeks of nutrition yep. uh, in the worst places on earth. And for us to have a little bit of, you know, uh, contact and and uh, our efforts in helping her um, is like so fulfilling. Yeah. And I can I can name I name that one, but there's so many. Um, so we we. I love the work, getting back to your question, because we have the ability and we're fortunate to be successful enough to be able to devote the time and the resource to do, resources to do those kinds of things. That's amazing when you really think about it in this day and age where every day is a battle for a lot of upstart businesses, upstart right. large firms, whatever it is. You know, you've know, you gotten to that point where you can take another step and not have to think about or how am I going to monetize right. this element? but I'll turn it around I'm, yep. and, and looking at you um, you know you're 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 doing something great here and it, it. it really deserves uh, m- much more notoriety in a good way um, and in in your way in your own way you're doing a service you're doing a great service to the people it. of Rhode Island and beyond and you know more people need to know about this we have so many things going on in Rhode Island that are under the radar, people don't know that are so good and so instrumental and add to the quality of life in our state. People, but, but we just don't get to it. We just don't see it, you know? So many people are wrapped up in their narrow cast worlds yeah. that if they just open their eyes just a little bit, we'll all be better off. Is that something that is? Do you think is going to change naturally, or are we going to like the players, if you will, in Rhode Island media? Do you see that shifting here in general, or are people just so comfortable with brands that? I think it's beyond brands, Uh, and um, it's frustrating too, uh, Bill, in, in so many ways because people, just regular people, just average everyday Rhode Islanders and Americans, they have so much pressure on them just to survive, just to feed their kids and keep a roof over their heads and to have health care and to to do the normal things, right? And then maybe go out to dinner on a Friday night or a Saturday night and take their kids to the clam place and, you know, Iggy's or wherever it is. Um, There's so much pressure on them, and I'm asking them to open their eyes and do more, right? Right. But it is this push and pull. It's this... Maybe you can make your life better by understanding the world around you a little bit better. Maybe you can actually feel better by helping someone else, even though you need help. Uh, there is this thing going on in, in our world right now. Part of it is the fault of social media, certainly, and our reliance on devices you know, constantly. It's so funny to say that, ironic to say that, because that's what we're doing right now. Right, yeah. Right? But hopefully, maybe, you know, one thing that you've said or I've said will help somebody and give them the ins- that inspiration, that spark to do something. And uh, I just think that we, we're, we're just all so stressed that if we can de-stress by helping, which seems counterintuitive, right, um, we'll, we'll feel better. And that'll open our, our eyes to bigger possibilities. Right. It's about helping other people. I've I've said to my partners and to the world at large upon my retirement that I want to do other stuff that's good. I want to do whether it's whether it's, you know, movies or videos or storytelling. I know that I want I want a lot of it to be for good things. Mm-hmm. You know, I just we don't have enough good things out there. Yeah, I I agree with that. It seems like we're constantly forced into a narrower and narrower artistic and entertainment realm certainly news media it's just not the same menu as it was although it is there's more to choose from but the menu you know and have those gatekeepers that that serviced the average person i have the benefit of 41 years of experience i'm 61 and i've been doing this you know from tw- from the age of 20 and i have developed lots and lots of friendships with people you know I have great friendships with people in law enforcement I have great friendship with people who are criminals I have you know as I told you before top executives captains of industries and I have startups uh, yeah. I you know so I have a perspective I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm an expert but I have a perspective about what makes a lot of us tick and we're not so different 
we're not so different. I mean, I can tell you that I know a billionaire who's as committed, who, who's as a regular guy as the guy that's making $14,000 a year. He's the same guy. Mm -hmm. It's just circumstances and, you know, being in the right place at the right time in some, some cases. But they're the same people. They have the same moral values. They have, and, you know, we're not connecting them enough. And um, there are so many good people that want to be connected, and they just don't have the, that conduit. And we have some people that are trying to, to facilitate that. I want to be one of those people. What's your plans for Rhode Island? You know, you, you mentioned in your, uh, I guess, your semi-retirement message that you weren't going to Florida yet, Rhode Island <laughs> South. Where my parents Every, are. It's so it's so sad. It's so sad that you know, uh, probably three quarters of uh, our pension money, you know, leaves the state. Um, and uh, you know, I joke about it, but it is a real problem. Yeah. Because you know, you can only take so much nine hundred degree weather, and you know, white shoes and early bird dinners. Uh, yeah. It's it's <laughs> I. I, in the spirit of full disclosure, you know what, my wife and I have a little place in, uh, in Naples that we've had for 26 years and it's a little postage stamp size condominium and it's great. And I see myself there for a month or two, maybe, um, you know, I don't know that that is where I want to be. I love Rhode Island. I wish we were better. I wish we had less onerous taxes, property yeah. taxes. I wish that we had better infrastructure, but I think we're getting there. I think in some respects we're getting there. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of uh, the governor's economic initiatives. It's at least something. Um, she is one smart person, and I think that um, she has at least gotten the the people talking, you know, people talking and she's gotten the engines fired up. Some people don't agree. Maybe all the things that she's done aren't right, but I think that there's something. We need something to spark us forward. Um, and uh, um, hopefully we'll fix the roads. Hopefully we'll fix education. Hopefully we'll fix the tax structure and people will want to stay here because we have a beautiful state. We have so much great art and culture and just physical beauty um people you know why do, why do these f f transplanted rhode islanders who live in florida come back in the summer and you know spend the summers at bonnet and newport and wherever right you know again with money that is no longer no longer doing things for us it's doing something for the state of florida yeah. um or wherever uh, but they come back here. Why do they come back here? Because they want to be here. Because they love Rhode Island. Um, so it's an interesting and odd dynamic again. What's the major, I guess, the focal point of change in your mind looking five to ten years out? Is it infrastructure, education, economic I, development? I mean, it's, it's obviously it's all of them. But I have, I have like the stupidest ideas in the world, some yeah. people tell me. And that <laughs> is that we need to keep young people here, right? Yeah, what a dumb idea. Yeah. Right, <laughs> and I think that, you know, with certain conditions, I think that we should make it as easy as possible for uh, kids who graduate uh, out of our colleges to stay here until, like, the age of 28 or so yep. and give them real incentives to do so. Uh, but they're tied to something. There's a, It's a contract with the state of Rhode Island. And um, conversely, I think that we should do the same for uh, people who are 65 plus and give them a reason to stay here and not create a residency somewhere else. Make it worth their while to stay here. If they want to have a vacation home, fine, but don't make it so it has to be their residency because they can save a whole ton of money, you know, on the back end. I, I don't blame anyone for doing it, mm -hmm. it you know, uh, but we have to do more to keep the young and the old. We, we just have to do it. Um, and I, you know, I don't see great action on those fronts. What's your favorite uh, thing to do in the summer? Are you a beach person or, you know, do you have that kind of um, secret so, hobby? <laughs> uh, I, my, my least favorite thing to do is a yeah. boot camp on Saturday and Sunday mornings with a bunch of friends down in Narragansett. 
with probably 10 or 15 people that you know very well, yeah. I'm sure. Um, Ed Fitzpatrick has been missing in action, just by the way. Is Ed, that right? if you're listening, you've been missing in action. The globe got him. Yeah. What um, do you do, ride, ride swim, and, and jog? Is it like a triathlon type no, thing? No, no, no. It's, uh, it's a bunch of crazy, crazy stupid things that one of our, our, our esteemed leader puts us through. Gotcha. Who <laughs> remain nameless. Um, my favorite thing to do is to be down by the water reading, um, riding my bike. On the bike trails that we have, on the bike paths that we have, amazing, um, right? What eating, an asset. Eating our great, you know, food, local fresh food. We are so fortunate. We're, we're literally so fortunate that we have all of, we have we have the city, we have the we have the ocean, and uh, everything in between. Right, and I I discovered Newport. Uh, I discovered Newport, but you know, <laughs> in late in my life, growing up in in Rhode Island, I never I would go there. You know, I'd go to the festivals. I'd go for historic stuff. I think I went to the Navy War College one time because Mark Janest was my professor at URI. Oh, really? But basically, to me, it was a tourist spot. And I met someone, gosh, now like five or six years ago when I was on tour with a band. I saw they had Rhode Island plates, and I was like, Oh, Providence! And they were like, No, we're from Newport. We're a Newport band. I was like, Really, a Newport band? That's odd. And sure enough, what an unbelievable community. You've got everyone from retired naval pilots through people who have come up from the Folk and Jazz Festival in the, in the 50s and 60s through a fairly young, not necessarily 20s, late 20s, 30s, uh, groups of, of bands and painters and sculptors and tech innovators in Newport. So it's not just Providence either when it comes to sort of the the innovation and the new industries it's all throughout the state and it's in northern rhode island as well but but that's something that i'm amazed by is the 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 the, within our small confines there are multiple epicenters of ideas happening at any given point in time that's right and you know how do we how do we exploit them right 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 how does that get elevated right Um, there's there's so many great small stories um I have a friend that used an expression once, um, these, these small things that loom large. Mm-hmm. And it's literally true uh, because what you're doing may, feels like a small thing. It's not. It looms large for so many reasons. And we have those people precisely that you talked about who are in a studio in Chapachet or Hopkinton or Wyoming, you know, or in Westerly uh, that are doing things that are literally changing our our system, our society, our our neighborhoods, and um, they just don't get the light of day. That's right. Last question. Uh, Providence, obviously, we're looking at this education crisis here. I mean, there's nothing new to that, but now the, to the extent in which Fox News this morning was – talking about it's in the wall street journal opinion column is that type of uh national identity how dangerous is that i guess to advancing all the other things that you brought up as far as just just in terms of messaging and communicating what's going on here or can it be spun like a positive like detroit where hey look nowhere to go but up so let's bring in anybody with a new idea let's do it now i think it's i think it's hyper dangerous and um think about the ceo who is thinking or was thinking or may in the future be thinking of relocating something to rhode island and hearing that you know the school system in the capital city is in such complete and utter disrepair um having spent a lot of time in those schools for different reasons it it was an obvious it was an obvious thing and it 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 wasn't the John Hopkins report that brought it to light. It brought it to light in a mass media way, mm-hmm. but it didn't bring it to light to those people that could have changed it, that had the power, were empowered to change it. And I think the first thing to solving this problem is for everyone to stop lying, for everyone to stop deflecting. And uh, those people who I'm referring to know who they are. They need to stop deflecting and lying and just fix the freaking problem. That's what needs to be done. Um, There is an abundance of talent in this state that will come together. 
All you have to do is ask them. They will come together and they will help fix the problem. But first and foremost, we have to make the schools safe and, and, and habitable for our kids. It is an utter shame. It is a travesty that the Providence schools are in the, are in the, the way that they are. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great, great Providence school teachers, and there are some awful teachers. They have to police themselves. So let's put the, you know, when we're talking about this issue, you have to put the teacher issue aside because they have to fix that issue in turn. They have to do it. And yep. if they don't, they're part of the problem. That's right, yeah. Um, but first and foremost, you've got to fix the infrastructure because no one deserves to try to learn in, a, in an environment like that. It is, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's it's it was some of the photos were shocking to see just in terms of the dilapidation of these right. classrooms. I mean, I, right. I, I just can't even wrap my head around it. I would see the disparity play out in sports a lot of times. I actually referee so- soccer and basketball uh, for 20 something years. I was, that was like my middle school job and I still do it very part time. But I'll, if I mean, if you go and referee Central Falls versus South Kingstown, if that game's played in South Kingstown. There's a stadium, concession stands, parents in matching warm-up suits. The kids have warm-up suits. You know, the whole thing, the athletic director, the cop, the this, the that, the other. You play that game in Central Falls. That's at a field across from the Wyatt Detention Center. No facilities, no warm-up suits, none of it. But the, the reality is the kids on the field, that especially because they're engaged in, in the soccer game, they're equal kids. They're the same kid. Their their brains are firing. They're creative. They're they can easily dis from both sides. They can be disrespectful and respectful. Uh, and uh, you know that that venue has um, really you know bothered me. Just the notion that we're on any kind of equal ground here in this state. Uh, obviously, that's hyper exaggerated when you go inside the schools themselves. Not just Providence, but Woonsocket, even Central Falls. I was at a I was at a basketball game at Mount Pleasant and, um, last year, and I'm sitting in the stands. And I'm saying I'm freezing. What the, like, yeah. what's going on here? And, and like I, I've got this cold breeze on my head, and I turn around. There's this gaping hole in the window, and so I said to somebody, I "said How long has that been like that? A couple of months." Wow. It's like, come on. I mean, you know, what's going on here? We can't fix a window? It's shocking, yeah. My, my wife uh, was a speech pathologist in Central Falls for over 30 years, and um, she had the opportunity to go to a lot of other systems, and she didn't want to because she was so passionate about how great her system was and the things that they were able to accomplish and how committed all the teachers were yep. to one goal just helping those kids be better. Um, so it's about, as we get back to like sort of the central theme here, it's about what's within you to do what's good. And um, that can happen in Providence, but there seems to be so many obstacles in, in, in the way of progress there. Yeah, it's a shame because it's, it is a creative city and there's a lot of you know, reason to think that it could become one of those cities in the world that's attractive to anybody. Right. Uh, but as currently constituted, it's tough to say. For me, I look at it and go, "Boy, how wh- do you put roots down here? I mean, is the, in Providence, or do you have to look somewhere else in the state?" Uh, I love it here in the city, and on the one hand, at the same time, I'm very discouraged by that disconnection between where we are now, Elmwood, South Providence, and other parts of the city. So, so quick story. Yeah, um, I started my career yeah. at 270 Elmwood Avenue, just down the road. Yep. And uh, as I told you, I was the runner, and uh, we lived essentially in the se- in the middle of what is South Providence. And when you say South Providence to people, it conjures up a perception yep. to people. And um, I have to tell you that they were some of the greatest times, and they continue to be because I yeah. spend a lot of time in in where we are right now in South Providence. Yep. Um, we have some of the best restaurants here. We have some of the greatest people. Um, and we have people that are trying to uh, literally uh, decimate that perception because that perception shouldn't exist. Right. Um, and so we just need all of us to to work together. We, we just need to, like, figure out that you don't have to be the, you know, the guy with the last word all the time and just 
someone else, if someone else has a better idea, embrace it and let's get it done. But we just have so many selfish, arrogant, misguided people that it just pains me sometimes to have to endure it. I know. You know? It's so true. Yeah. You just, yeah. sometimes you wonder, do you just delete Twitter? At least I do. I think yeah. I could just, I have a parachute. I could just, I don't have to pay attention to this at all. You know, we all do technically, but how how guilty would you feel afterwards knowing that in a sense you kind of turn your back on this this state and, and the city? Um, yeah, I agree. It's just the, the, the perception is just at a point now where I hear on talk radio and other places, this notion that Providence is fundamentally a dangerous place to go to, you know, that you shouldn't park at the mall because some gang member is going to mug you on your way into the, we, uh, you know. we do this, uh, we do this campaign. I think you're familiar with called the ripple effect. Yep. And, um, it's one of the things that I'm most proud of that I've done in my career in terms of the creative, um, and all credit, uh, in terms of allowing us to do it goes to Peter Alvidi at, uh, at DOT for yep. having the courage to say to us, okay, go do that thing that you want to do, even though it's something that the states have never been comfortable. You know, we, we state agencies never do anything that is crazy, right? right. <laughs> uh, so we've done these, you know, we've done, we've done some really great spots. So we did this one spot with this little girl who's a spirit, and uh, she is, she's approaching this uh, car where she died. And it's a it's a really mysterious spiritual spot, and it's gotten it, it it's been very well received, uh, and it's very effective. Um, but there was this one comment, it was this one comment on Facebook or Twitter or something, and the comment was, uh, "That's just stupid. Just fix the roads. Stop doing stuff like this." Right, right, right. So okay, so we shouldn't tell people not to drive drunk we should just fix the roads. Right. And it was so mean spirit. The comment was, it, there was, luckily there was that only one, but you, it was, it's indicative. It's indicative of this, of this deeper issue and this deeper problem of cynicism and uh, of anything that is trying to be good because we've been screwed so many times. with, And so right. we've, we've, going to this extreme in some cases and you know many respects that's what talk radio is about right right um and i love when guys like gene valicenti call you know call the caller on it saying well you know this good stuff is happening too right um and uh there's a quick hang up you know it's uh so it's we live in very difficult and strange and odd times but i think there is there is light we just we need to exploit that light yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, one final thought as well. What's your message to anyone who might be thinking about possibly moving to Rhode Island or that is thinking about leaving here, you know, to, to keep the momentum down, especially that those younger kids that are constantly dreaming of going to New York? Yeah, um, I don't want I don't want I want everyone to follow their dream. That's what yeah. I want. Yep. I want everyone to do that. Um, but I want to offer those same people uh every reason why it's it's so great and so advantageous to stay here and if we can't figure out how to keep uh these creative smart young people here the kids that are graduating from RISD Brown PC Rick wherever Salve keeping them here and contributing in a meaningful way um I I think that we're just doomed to keep repeating this frustration cycle um and hopefully things like the wexford will be helpful in that res respect but it takes more than the wexford it takes all those little places that you were talking about all these little centers of innovation and distinction that are everywhere in every corner and pocket of this state to somehow be recognized and maybe instead of giving you know, uh, you know, maybe we need to figure out how to carve out some funding for them in some way. You know, and I know that there are grants and there are things, yep. but they're they're not they're not well known enough, or there's not enough of them to to recognize and to reward 
uh, stuff that we, even, we haven't even heard about yet. That's all for today, but I'll be back on Friday with a brand new episode. Remember, there's over 100 episodes of Bartholomew Town waiting for you on your favorite app, BartholomewTown.com or RIPodcast.com. Until next time, I'm Bill Bartholomew. We'll talk soon. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.